Now the king of Chu put down his arms and gave up on attacking Sung. Another time, there was a man named Duan Gan Mu who gave up his career and stayed at home. The Lord of Wei went to his town and formally paid his respects to the townspeople. When his servant asked him why he was doing this, the Lord replied, Because Duan Gan Mu lives here. The servant said, Duan Gan Mu is a man of no account. Isn't it going too far to pay respects to his town like this? The Lord said, Duan Gan Mu does not chase after power and profit, but takes the way of the enlightened to heart. Though he lives anonymously in a poor neighborhood, his good name is known far and wide. How can I not honor his town? The Lord went on, He is radiant with virtue. I am radiant with power. He is ethically rich. I am materially rich. Power is not as honorable as virtue. Possessions are not as noble as ethics. Even if he could change places with me, he wouldn't do it. Later, when the kingdom of Qin had raised an army to attack Wei, one of the peers of Qin opposed the plan, saying, Duan Gan Mu is a wise man and his ruler honors him. Everyone knows this. All the lords have heard of it. If we raise an army to attack Wei, would this not be unethical? Because of this, the king of Qin gave up his plan to attack Wei. Moa Tzu ran a thousand miles to secure the survival of Chu and Song. Duan Gan Mu pacified Qin and Wei without leaving home. Action and inaction are opposite, but they can both be used to preserve nations. This is what is called reaching the same goal by different roads. Leaders see with the eyes of the whole nation, hear with the ears of the whole nation, think with the knowledge of the whole nation, and move with the strength of the whole nation. For this reason, their directives reach all the way to the lower echelons, while the feelings of the masses come to the notice of the leaders. There are physical and mental limits to what a person can do. This is why someone with one body occupies one position, and someone with one skill works at one craft. When their strength is up to task, people do not consider it a heavy burden. When their ability suits a craft, people do not consider it hard to do. There are ways to evaluate people. If they are in positions of high status, observe what they promote. If they are wealthy, observe what they give. If they are poor, observe what they refuse to accept. If they are of low status, observe what they refuse to do. If they are covetous, observe what they will not take. See them change difficulties, and you can know their courage. Move them with joy and happiness, and you can observe their self-control. Entrust them with goods and money, and you can assess their humanity. Shake them with fear, and you can know their discipline. Let rulers hold to uprightness and fairness as a plumb line, and officials who come to them with dishonest designs might as well be breaking eggs by throwing them at a rock or trying to set fire to water. There was a king who liked slender waists, and people starved themselves to become thin. Another king admired bravery, and people endangered themselves and fought duels to the death. As we can see from these examples, the handle of authority and power easily influences fashions and changes morals. When subjects do not get what they want from their rulers, the rulers cannot get what they seek from their subjects either. What rulers and subjects give each other is motivated by reciprocity, for which subjects will exert themselves to the full and lay down their lives in the interests of their rulers, while rulers will grant honors for the benefit of their subjects. If rulers cannot reward unworthy subjects, then subjects cannot die for unworthy rulers. If the blessings bestowed by rulers do not reach the citizens, and yet the rulers want to use the people, this is like whipping a bucking bronco. This is similar to expecting crops to ripen without rain, an impossibility. If rich rewards are given to those without merit, and high titles are given to those who have not worked, 
then people in office will be lazy about their duties and idlers will advance rapidly. If people are put to death without having committed any crime and honest people are punished, then those who cultivate themselves will not be encouraged to do good and evildoers will think little of treason. In an enlightened government, the state executes criminals without any anger on the part of the ruler. The court rewards the worthy without any involvement on the part of the ruler. Those who are executed do not resent the ruler because the punishment fits the crime. Those who are rewarded do not attribute it to the ruler because it was brought about by their accomplishments. Thus the people know that it is up to them whether they are punished or rewarded. Without serenity, there is no way to illuminate one's character. Without calm, there is no way to persevere. Without magnanimity, there is no way to embrace everyone. Without kindness, there is no way to care for all the people. Without fairness, there is no way to make sound judgments. Therefore, a wise ruler employs people where a skilled craftsman works wood, large and small, Long and short, there is an appropriate use for everything. Ruler and compass, square and round, each has its application. Though shapes be different and materials diverse, there are none that cannot be used. Even the most virulent poison can be useful in the hands of a skilled physician. Since even the materials of the forest and field are not wasted, why should people be rejected? Now, when people are not elected to court or honored in the provinces, that does not mean they are unworthy, but only that the positions available to them are not their proper work. Useful suggestions should not be rejected just because they come from people in low positions, nor should useless suggestions be followed just because they come from people in high positions. Right and wrong are not a question of social status. Enlightened leaders listen to their ministers. If their plans are useful, the leaders do not look down on them because of their rank. And if what they say is feasible, the leaders do not care about how they say it. Ignorant rulers are not like this. As far as their familiars and associates are concerned, even if they are dishonest, the rulers cannot see it. And when it comes to strangers and people of lowly status, even when they are diligent and loyal, the leaders cannot know it. Those who have something to say are badgered about their choice of words, while those who have criticisms are punished as if they had committed a crime. If you want to illumine the land and sustain the communities this way, that is like covering your ears to listen to music or covering your eyes to look at a painting. Even if you have good hearing and eyesight, you will still be far off. If people can see what is not beneficial to them in such a way as to benefit others, that is acceptable. When a madman runs off and someone runs after him, both are running in the same direction, but they're running for different purposes. When a man is drowning in the water and someone goes in to save him, both are in the water, but they've gone in for different reasons. Using the measures and regulations of one generation or one age to govern the world is like the case of a traveler in a boat who drops his sword in the middle of the river and notches the edge of the boat to mark the spot where the sword fell. Then he goes back to the riverbank that evening to look for the sword below the notch on the boat. He is far from knowing what is what. In an ideal state, those of high social standing are not given lighter sentences, and those of low social status are not given heavier sentences.